Resident Evil Remake is certainly the actual best Resident Evil game in the series, but even the all-time greats have their little mistakes. Like how the Stars Alpha team decides to search for their Bravo team in the middle of the night, while the Bravo team itself also went missing in the middle of the night while investigating bizarre murders that have been occurring in the Arklay Mountains. And nobody questions Wesker as to why they didn't just wait until the morning, where they could have had a better chance at finding evidence and not have to worry too much about getting lost in a forest. Nor does anybody talk about the training facility that exploded merely a day before this event, which is only a few miles away from the mansion they're about to enter. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about 10 people. Victims were apparently beaten. Yeah, don't bother to question how someone was able to capture photos of those murders and report them to the news without Umbrella noticing or putting a stop to it. This is a company that is developing bioweapons in secrecy and attempting to sell them to militaries across the globe. But then again, nothing in Resident Evil makes a lot of sense unless you deprive yourself of oxygen for a few minutes just before you die. The entire purpose of this game is to lure the Stars Alpha team into the Spencer Mansion and use them as combat data for bioweapons. But Umbrella, or Wesker if you want to be more accurate, could have easily hired a group of trained mercenaries for the same task, get the same results with the high likelihood of all them being killed, and not have to worry if the bioweapons succeeded, since the mercs would most likely be from different countries and not from the city that is mere miles away from the Spencer Mansion. It's not bad enough that Alpha Team searches for Bravo Team in the middle of the night, but then Joseph makes the crucial mistake of splitting from the group, which is precisely why he ends up getting killed. You need at least a level 10 protagonist vest like Rebecca and Zero if you want to make it out alive from making such a decision. Wesker reaffirms his eternal OG scumbag edgelord status by wearing sunglasses at night. Those gunshots you hear are from Jill shooting the Cerberus. However, none of them appear to be injured by bullet wounds, but one of them goes down with one shot when Chris fires at it, which means Jill must have forgotten to turn on auto-aim. Hey, Brad! Where the hell's he going? He got a call from Chief Irons that reminded him he's in a video game. It would make too much sense if he stuck around and immediately evacuated you as soon as things went wrong. He has his orders to inexplicably remove himself from the game until the finale. There are only three STARS members left now. Captain Wesker, Barry, and myself. We don't know where Chris is. This will be the game's excuse as to why you play without the rest of your team by your side, which will also fly in the face of the gameplay that requires you to find specialized keys that open specific doors. How can you possibly lose track of your team when they can't even access the rooms that would cause you to get lost? Also, you somehow lose track of your fellow officers when you all entered the mansion together. This game has the unfortunate position of being a vanguard for the brown and gray era, a time period where every major title had to be desaturated to a point where it was devoid void of any personality, and pretend like it had a depressing tone to it. Thank goodness we are long removed from those years, but it's one of those time periods I wish never existed. The speedrunner's worst nightmare. There's a reason why the door skip mod exists. I think you'd better take a look at this. You gotta take a look at this, cliche. Jill, see if you can find any other clues. I'll be examining this. Don't fall for his trick, Jill. Barry is just trying to prevent you from seeing him live out his fantasies by masturbating to the sight of blood. Why do you think he's such an avid gun collector? How do you take one of the most iconic moments in video game history and make it better? Just make the zombie more grotesque and somewhat realistic. Ups the terror factor immensely. Any of you planning your own remake should take a lesson from this. Look out! It's a monster! Let me take care of it! Once again, it takes three magnum shots to bring down this zombie. I understand it's the game's way of establishing how much of a threat zombies are, but that contradicts the gameplay where they could be killed in a few shots from your regular handgun, and sometimes they can go down from a single critical headshot. And that's while you're playing on normal mode. What's going on around here? I can't figure it out. Same here. Chris, and now Wesker. Wesker and Chris forgot to inform Jill and Barry that they were testing out their prototype teleportation device that zombies would later get to use that allows them to inexplicably disappear from the game until the sheet of schoolbook note paper called a plot demands them to return. I almost forgot. It's a lockpick. You'd make better use of it. The so-called master of unlocking once again does not properly prepare herself by having a lockpick on her to begin with. That now makes both classic Resident Evil games featuring Jill, three when you count this remake, where Jill doesn't bring her lockpick with her on active duty. It would be best for her to use her combat skills and pursue a wrestling career, and change her name to Jill the Sandwich Valentine. At least then, her moniker would be more appropriate, catchy, and accurate. Now, I can finally deduct some sins for the refined classic RE gameplay formula and how well 
well it pays attention to detail. There will be times where you carry a weapon like the shotgun and Jill or Chris will move slower due to its weight, but breeze through with the greatest of ease when they're unequipped. There's also a new mechanic in the form of defensive weapons, where you have a method to avoid damage from zombies by impaling them with a dagger, immobilizing them with a stun gun, or stuffing their pie hole with a grenade and exploding their head, guaranteeing that they stay dead. To up the challenge and scare factor, there's a new enemy called Crimson Heads, powerful zombies that reanimate after a certain amount of time if you don't set them on fire by using a canteen and a lighter. And if you're like me, you try to gather zombies into a particular area and down them all into that one spot, so when you go to burn them, you incinerate them all at once. Choosing between Chris and Jill is also a strong commitment in and of itself. Jill is basically easy mode where she possesses two extra inventory slots, the lockpick with unlimited use, gains access to the grenade launcher, can play the piano without anyone's help, and has the ability to mix chemicals into the V-Jolt formula that will kill Plant 42, and allow her to avoid that particular encounter entirely. The only real disadvantage she has is that she's weak on health and can die quickly if you're not careful. Chris is where the true survival horror experience is at. Seeing as how he has fewer inventory slots, can only carry a small door key with limited uses, does not gain access to the grenade launcher, needs Rebecca's help to play the piano, and doesn't have the ability to create the V-Jolt formula, which means he has no choice but to fight Plant 42. His only advantages are having higher HP and possessing a higher chance at critical hits. All of these possibilities increase the game's replay value and reminds everyone how to properly remake a game. It improves the gameplay of the original, expands upon its locations, introduces a few of its own new ideas, but most importantly, preserves the style of the original so that it pleases the old fans, but allows for a more modern control scheme so that it doesn't completely alienate newcomers. You know, unlike some other remakes I can mention. Somehow, Chris finds his samurai edge on the floor of the main hall, even though he had it with him before him and the rest of stars entered the mansion. I'm not sure why this decision was made, since the only piece of gameplay before this was investigating the gunshot just outside of the dining room. Chris was gonna make it back to the main hall anyways, so there was no reason to start him off without his handgun. Not five minutes into actual gameplay, and we're already getting our first instance of the teleporting dead, since this zombie appears in the closet room to catch Jill off guard, even though it never appeared when she entered this area, and there was never a sound indicating it opened a door. Whisker! Barry! Help! Jill, you know you could have just shot that doorknob, right? Or, you know, use those unlocking skills that you're supposed to be famous for. The ceiling trap lowers past the top of the door in this shot, but when the cutscene plays out, it's further above Jill to where it looks like it just activated. That was a close one. A second late. You would have fit nicely into a sandwich. That's not how the meme works, Barry. You overstuffed your vest and forgot to bring the appropriate amount of 90s cheese that would make that line more effective and memorable. Future Resident Evil games sure didn't have a problem cracking jokes about this moment, but this game itself decides to not embrace the absurdity that fans actually loved. All right then, let's split up again. So after discovering the massacre of your fellow Bravo team, one of your own people getting devoured by mutated canines, said canines chasing you into this very mansion, the other half of your remaining team going missing once you get inside the mansion, and a near-death experience mere minutes ago, you still think it's a good idea to split up further. It's a good thing Resident Evil didn't turn out to be an RPG, because Jill would have completely forgotten to invest points into the intelligence category. Hey, hold on a sec. Look what I've found. What? A can of fizz. This can of fizz Barry's referring to are the acid rounds, which wouldn't make sense as to why he's giving them to us, since we don't have the grenade launcher yet. And the terrace where it's located is locked with the armor key, which we haven't acquired yet. And I would think Barry of all people would know his ammo types, given that he's a weapons expert. If I do enough bath salts and drill my ears with a soldering gun, I can tolerate a mansion with questionable locks and puzzles needed to be solved in order to access its areas. But then the game takes it up a notch by someone playing placing an imitation of the armor key inside of a dog collar, something that is absolutely pointless since the imitation can still fool the trap that would kill the person attempting to take the real armor key. Jill finds Richard mortally wounded in the pillar corridor, which shouldn't be possible since this room was locked with the armor key, which is located on the other side of the mansion, and you would have needed the fake armor key to obtain the real key. The same thing goes for Chris when he finds Rebecca in the same corridor. The only way this would make any sense is if Rebecca found the armor key first, which 
she didn't, and locked the door to prevent zombies from entering while she treated Richard. However, that also wouldn't make any sense, since the serum needed is on the other side of the mansion. He seems to have been bitten by a poisonous snake. That is a field medic who doesn't know the difference between venomous and poisonous. Poison is a toxic substance you ingest. Venom is a toxic substance an animal injects into your bloodstream via a bite or a sting, which is what happened. You had six years to fix this translation issue and you still managed to get it wrong. Bring me serum. I saw some, but didn't bring any. And how would that particular serum work against a bite from a snake that's been infected and mutated by the T-virus? I would think the virus would have altered the venom to the point where it would no longer be treatable by traditional medicine that's meant to be effective against conventional bites. H here's my radio. Take it. Yes, Jill. Take this piece of equipment you should have already had on you to begin with, since you decided to further split from your team and this would be the only way for you to contact them if you were to get into any trouble. Also, since you have your radio now, how come you don't bother trying to contact Chris, Wesker, or Barry? You know, the people you were with before you entered the mansion and should still be within the mansion area. Let's also point out how meaningless it is to help Richard, since he'll end up dying regardless. He either ends up sacrificing himself to Yon in Jill's campaign, or sacrifices himself himself to Neptune in Chris's campaign. Rebecca, you okay with a gun? Chris, she may be a field medic, but she's still a part of STARS. I don't think she would have been able to make it on the force if she didn't know the basics of using a gun. Speaking of which, Rebecca decides to keep her secrets by not telling Chris about the events that happened in the previous day with Billy, the training facility, and the Queen Leech. Information that would very much be vital to Alpha Team's investigation and provide crucial details as to what's really been going on in the Arklay Mountains. It shouldn't count as a flaw against this remake, but it was initially released in the same year as Resident Evil Zero, and that game was originally planned to release on the N64. So I would think there would be dialogue that better connects the two games and what we got, instead of waiting for Umbrella Chronicles to give them more depth. This may be one of the most memorable moments in Resident Evil, but it always struck me as being pretty weird that someone who is clearly mutating into a zombie would still have the capability to write words perfectly. If someone was truly going through a transformation like that, I would expect them to have the mental deterioration of a sloth with dementia. me, Chris. Rebecca. That sounded like Moonlight Sonata. Rebecca is able to determine that Chris was playing Moonlight Sonata, despite the fact that Chris only played a few notes that were off-key, mind you. Yeah, I don't think you'd be able to tell what song that is just from that. With a build-up like this, you would anticipate a fight against something that would terrify you and keep you alert. But it's just another zombie that somehow knows how to open and close doors. But at least there's one benefit, that being you don't have to listen to the atrocious basement music that was present in the director's cut of the original. <laughs> Son of a bitch. The puzzle with the four death masks is the final major puzzle of the first mansion section, and typically that triggers the boss of that particular area. But the creature inside the chained coffin is a crimson head, an enemy you would have most likely already faced at this point. I was expecting more of a corpse bride that mutates into a praying mantis and secretes blue acid AOE damage whenever you shoot it at short range. Another new addition to this game is Lisa Trevor, who knocks out Jill or Chris, but doesn't kill them for some reason, even though she will end up attacking them in every other encounter, whether provoked or not. Also, Jill and Chris get dropped here, but then reawaken on the floor next to the stairs a few feet away. This is Brad. If you can hear me, just give me a sign. Well, Brad, maybe if you didn't abandon your teammates, you wouldn't need to radio them to see if they're alright. After acquiring the square crank, you can now drain the water that'll reveal a walkway that leads to the guardhouse. I don't understand why there wasn't a walkway with guardrails above the water so that there would be no need to drain it. But it's not necessary to destroy stars. What about my family? Barry is gonna say in a few moments that he's been talking to himself, which is actually quite believable, since nobody but him is present once you open the door. However, that was clearly another voice that was talking besides him, so he must be improving his vocal range by doing an excellent Wesker impression. Barry, I heard someone talking. Oh, you heard. I think age is starting to take its toll. Talking to myself is becoming a bad habit. Don't worry, 
I'm just going to get some fresh air. Barry couldn't have a lousier poker face than if he was a drunken juggalo sucking a helium machine out of game of Texas Hold'em. Deepest bluest, my hat is like a shark's fin. Deepest bluest, my hat is like a shark's fin. I did not select God Mode, Jill. A mutated shark grabbing hold of you like that should mean it's all over for you. Those times where the spiders are able to poison you even after you've killed them, spewing their remains like your drunk friend vomiting in your pickup when you're trying to shove their head out the window. You should be upset, viewer. You got to play the sensor version of this segment. What really goes on is far too lewd to only get an M rating. Capcom is keeping the good stuff as an in-house exclusive. Chris, you're okay. Yeah, I think we got to the root of that problem. Gonna have to call this one a failure. Most of the medical supplies here are from Umbrella. Umbrella? Don't you know? They're only the biggest taxpayers around here. No cultured Chris is unaware of the biggest pharmaceutical company in the world that is based in Raccoon City. You know, the very city that he lives in. Wesker literally shooting at nothing since there's no body of an enemy, and I already killed the bees earlier. Did you notice? Barry, he sounded a little flaky. Now that you mention it, yeah. I'll keep a close eye. Jill, you can't keep an eye on your teammates if you're Constantly separated. Jill to Brad, can you hear me? Malfunctioning radio shibboleth. Rebecca becomes terrified of a single hunter. This is the same Rebecca who defeated multiple zombies, leechmen, a proto-tyrant, and a queen leech just a day ago. It'll take Umbrella Chronicles to use the excuse she was exhausted from those conflicts. I didn't mean to get you worried. We can't stay here any longer. We have to get to the others and find a way out of here. You with me? Yes. Then I'll go ahead. Until then, Rebecca, you're on your own. What a magnificent galaxy-brained moment you have there, Chris. You just saved a lone woman that would have been attacked if you hadn't intervened. And now, you think it's a good idea to leave her on her own, even though you just asked her if she's with you. And this is going to be even more ridiculous when Chris convinces Rebecca to stick with him near the end of the game. No more following. Just stay with me, kid. I'm starting to understand why people chose Claire to be the one to continue the Redfield bloodline. Is that you, Jill? Enrico somehow notices Jill before she even reveals herself from around the corner. The stars are finished. Someone is a traitor. Umbrella set us up. <laughs> <laughs> It always struck me as being weird that neither Chris or Jill dashed around the corner to see who shot Enrico and neutralize them. But then I have to remember that this is Resident Evil, a series so absurd at times that it's necessary to dump logic into the recycle bin of your cerebrum for you to enjoy it. Also, there is absolutely no way Enrico would be in this sewer. Hell, to even get here, he would have needed the stone and metal object, which would give him access to the courtyard. But in order to get the stone and metal object, he would have needed to complete the death mask puzzle, since the object was in a coffin. But then he would have had to get the crank, which is in the outhouse, but he couldn't have accessed the waterfall entrance unless he got the battery to the side elevator. But the only way to get the battery is to access the elevator that's connected to the kitchen. But the only way to access the kitchen is to use the sword key, which would only be possible if you got the arrowhead that gives you access to the crypt that has the Book of Curses with the sword key attached to it. This man, Enrico, is jumping through so many level loopholes, I'm surprised he wasn't the main character in a portal game. Umbrella set us up! Character dies right after spilling crucial information cliche. In round one of Chris vs. the Boulder, Chris gains the victory. But he had to pull an Indiana Jones and dodge out of the way instead of using his final form to shore Yukon it into oblivion. Unfortunately, this version of Chris is still in his beta phase. Why in the hell is the giant spider called Black Tiger. I don't know how to feel about this segment. On one hand, it's a neat little betrayal interaction with Jill and Barry that'll give you the choice of whether to give Barry his magnum after Lisa shows up. And if you choose yes, the game finally gives you the partner dynamic that would have logically happened had it been a primary gameplay mechanic. But at the same time, it goes entirely against the logically unnecessary solo gameplay that you've had throughout the entire game at this point. It's as if the game made the flimsiest excuse as to why you don't stick with the partner the entire time and then said fuck it in the final hour like nobody's gonna notice. I don't believe that thing's really dead. Look at Barry, casually dropping insider knowledge that Umbrella Chronicles is in development. Get away from me! Uh, no! Hey! Uh, no! Ah! That sounds more like a man who's being tickled to death than being eaten alive. No explanation will be given as to why and how Chris or Jill are casually locked in a cell. The whole point of luring the STARS members is to use them for combat data against bioweapons with the hope that they don't survive. Why would Wesker bother capturing them and then placing them in a cell, completely negating their purpose? So 
Surprise, surprise! The weirdo who wears sunglasses at night turns out to be the main villain. Daredevil could have seen that coming from 10 miles away on top of Hell's Kitchen. Since when, Wesker? I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. Since when have they been slipping you a paycheck? Not even sure why you're asking that question, Chris. You already saw evidence that Wesker was a part of Umbrella's BOW research and development staff, which would indicate he's been working with Umbrella for quite some time now. Oh yes, dear. Just like this. Becca! That was Wesker shooting his barely legal waifu, whom he has a secret photo of in his desk where she's wearing her gym clothes. Let this be a warning to you ladies, no matter how impressive you think you are, you will never get to interfere in the Chris Wesker bromance. There's a reason why Wesker kept him alive for so long. Wesker, you're pathetic. In this game, yes he is. Kinda makes you wonder how he became the main antagonist for this series when he dies in the most anticlimactic way possible. Why eliminate stars? Believe it or not, that's Umbrella's intention. Yeah, and we already know this information based on the note we found earlier that clearly stated the true goal of this mission. The ultimate life form. Tyrant. <laughs> Wesker, you've become senile. God damn it, Chris. You're really gonna make me bring out that guy? Cause even I hate that guy. Actually, Chris, the word senile refers to the mental deterioration of an elderly person, and Wesker is nowhere near granddaddy status. I mean, I guess he could be somebody's daddy, depending on who you talk to. Alright, you need to shut the fuck up. What are you planning? I guess it's time for show and tell. Don't do it, Wesker. We've already had so many other villains meet their demise because they were cocky enough to explain the details of their evil plan to the protagonist, even though they have the upper hand and should just waste them. This observation note is being written by William Birkin, who seems to have some resentment towards Alexia Ashford. You know, the same Alexia that is currently in cryostasis during the events of this game, because she wants the T. Veronica virus to mature within her without causing rapid mutation. Why would Birkin feel the need to prove himself against a woman who who's not even conscious at this time. I found a file in the lab. Apparently there's still a lot of tyrant virus here. We should blow this whole place up! What would our precious Resident Evil games be without the trademark self-destruct system that gets activated for the flimsiest reasons? <laughs> So we just have flare rockets already here when nobody has made it to the rooftop before us? Why would Brad drop flare rockets here when he could have just landed the chopper? I think we can call this the first legitimate repeated boss fight in a Resident Evil game, since the tyrant never really mutates like Birkin, Mr. X, and Nemesis did, and we literally fought it like 10 minutes ago. Riding off into the sunrise cliché. I think of myself as a with superior deep.